Good evening. I invite everybody to the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees, <coughs> Tuesday, October 18th. Uh, may I have a call to order, please? Mr. Kaling. Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson. Present. Mr. Quadro. Present. Mayor Ciara. Present. And Dr. Pearson Campbell is absent tonight. Thank you. May we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> I'd like to read the mission statement for Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. The school is to prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Is there any participation by the public tonight? Hearing none. Participation by the trustees, Julie. All right, thank you. <coughs> Um, I have two announcements. One pertains to the business um, that we'll be conducting tonight, or the superintendent's report. But the first is um, about what happened last Wednesday, our fall program advisory night. It was a wonderful opportunity to witness the incredible synergy happening on campus among vocational teachers, industry representatives, parents, and students. We got to see a student chair her shop's advisory board meeting, the nuts and bolts of identifying the demographic characteristics of participants, shop teachers enthusiastically describing what students are learning and how it will prepare them to work in their chosen fields, and seasoned, savvy talk from professionals who are unquestionably dedicated <coughs> to an excellent education for the young people who will follow in their footsteps. This event is the true embodiment of authentic school community partnerships. It was a privilege to be an observer, and I thank Dr. Lincoln Holker and his leadership team for including us in the experience. Should I do the evaluation process now? Sure. Yeah? Right. Okay. Um, so, uh, Dr. Lincoln Holker and I have met um, at least twice to talk about the uh, his evaluation process, which has begun already this school year, um, and we are all involved <coughs> as a board. Uh, so in front of you, you have the outline of the uh, superintendent evaluation process as outlined by the state. So I'm going to just hit sort of the, these are the, the it's just a basic overview of it. So we all know what we're um, embarking on. And then in, I don't know which month, either in May or June, I think we'll, um, it will be up to us to um, deliver the final evaluation. So the purposes are to link the work of the superintendent to the goals of the district, um, to create a consistent set of standards throughout the state to measure performance, to connect the evaluation to the impact the superintendent has on student achievement, and to assist the superintendent in developing his own professional skills. So this is all from um, DESE and the MASC, right? Um, first component is a two-part tool, his goals. Um, evaluation models meant to foster the superintendent's growth and keep the focus on improving student achievement. Um, superintendents have to have one professional practice goal and one student learning goal. And you'll hear what both of those are from Dr. Vick and Hunker tonight. Uh, standards, there are four standards for superintendents. Instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture. And standards are broken down into indicators, which define more specific knowledge and skills. It's a pretty complicated evaluation system, but the, all of the educators and administrators here are very familiar with it, fluent with it for sure. Um, the second component is a five-step step cycle. Uh, first step is self-assessment. Self Dr. Lindsay Hoker already has completed that step. Uh, step two is the analysis, goal setting, and plan development. And Desi likes SMART goals, which I think we all know what those are. Step three is implementing the plan. Step four is the formative assessment. So about halfway through the cycle, the superintendent will provide us with an update on the progress of the plan as an agenda item at the trustees meeting. And then the fifth step is the summative evaluation. So that's at the end of the cycle, superintendent presents 
the self-assessment and evidence to support the work done to achieve the goals. <coughs> Individual committee members, so that's each one of us, five members of the Board of Trustees, will consider this and our own observations to evaluate the superintendent. And then our individual evaluations are compiled by a committee member, which will be me, um, into a composite evaluation, which will then be discussed and voted upon. And then the third and final component is a rating system. So at the summit, summative evaluation, the superintendent receives a rating for each goal, exceeded, met, significant progress, some progress, or did not meet. And the superintendent also receives a rating on each standard. Exemplary, proficient, needs improvement, unsatisfactory. These are combined into an overall rating of unsatisfactory to exemplary. And the superintendent has to be rated on each of those four standards that I mentioned above. Um, and receive an overall, to receive an overall rating of proficient, the superintendent must receive a rating of at least proficient on the instructional leadership standard. It sounds complicated, but wanted to give you all kind of an overview of what's ahead. Um, I think it, um, you know, will make sense as we look our way through it and um, we'll be included in the process. Perfect. Thank you, George. You're welcome. Richard, anything? Um, no, are we uh, property subcommittee or jump into that or we get into it? Get to it. No, I'm good for now. Thank you. Uh, I would like to bring up something uh, in regards to safety. Uh, we've been having a uh, problem for quite a few years, and it has really blown up to a major problem that I'm taking on personally uh, in regards to the safety of our students crossing uh, local street. The, the problem is that uh, over the years with the crosswalks, they paint them, things like that, but uh, as far as the students walking across in the morning, going over to the convenience store, uh, coming back over here, uh, last year uh, Joe and others put together a kind of put some cups, bought some flags. They used it to cross uh, to give the uh, people driving the cars the that people are crossing. Uh, those got gone by the wayside. Um, I get a phone call uh, from Mr. Brown uh, stating that they almost uh, students almost got hit out there. Uh, we have talked to the police department. The, the chief has said they will send cruisers up. Uh, it becomes a part-time situation. Um, it's not. There's no consistency at all. Uh, on myself, I took it upon myself years ago. The North End Lions Club had donated. And one of their projects was to put safety <coughs> signs, vertical signs, at crosswalks around the city. Uh, they did that as a project, and over the years they got knocked over, they got this, they got that. DPW picked up the ball on some of it, and, uh, but it, again, it was nothing consistent. Uh, I went up to Mark Morgio's <coughs> house, uh, past, uh, the current our past president of the Lions Club, he had three of those uh, vertical signs from years ago uh, that say state law, stop for pedestrians. Uh, I picked up three of them, brought them down here myself, Mr. Brown and I set them up out on the crosswalk, uh, and Timmy came up with one that was down in our back garage that he put at the other crosswalk. Uh, safety is number one. And I am nervous in the service in regards to the safety of our children crossing the streets. We have reached out to the DOT in regards to school safety. There's a uh, lady that I've worked with at some of the conventions. And uh, we've been told, because it's a four-lane highway out here, and it's a state highway, that they cannot put flashing lights that they have down in front of North End High School. I'm sorry, I'm not buying it. The safety of our kids are more important. Uh, I'm going to need pressure, Your Honor, uh, from your office with any help I can get. And Donna, anything that you can help me with uh, to try and uh, you know, make this a safer environment for our students. But uh, I just wanted to get this out to be on, on the record. Uh, I feel it's personally uh, 
that around the city there's been accidents, there's been fatal accidents, there's been uh, crossing guards that got hit up in front of JFK, they've got hit down in front of the high school, and that's where the person trying to slow cars down. Uh, I talked to police officers. Police officers said to me, Mike, well, we're doing road jobs. They want to run us over. He said, it's a problem everywhere. And it's not just you. Well, not just me doesn't matter. Uh, it is just me as far as I'm concerned. And uh, as much as I'm harping on it right now, I will be harping on it a lot more in the future. But uh, that's my piece as far as the trustees' uh, participation. Thank you. Uh, the next agenda, agenda item may I have a motion to second to approve the minutes of the September 20th, 22 Board of Trustees meeting. So second. <coughs> Is there any further discussion? Nice job, as always. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we have Mr. Lorraine in the room. Uh, Jeff's going to give us a report on our great athletics that they're doing fabulous and uh, but one of our big things is co-op as well yep good evening um just want to give you a quick report uh, a little bit about co-op and a little bit about yeah. sports so currently and i'll give this over to deb because there's students names on it but um there are currently 33 seniors out on co-op right now and there's three that are in a queue to go out in the next week or two <clears throat> um two from animal science uh animal science and one from criminal justice and they're all new places i uh, went out with beth last week to two different places one's luther farms and one's fuller farms uh for the ag sci science kids that are going out and the one student that's going to go out uh in criminal justice he's going to go out to the northampton pd um so that's good because we got out into the northampton fire department last year um so it's it's great and then this year the northampton fire department took a automotive um, repair student to work on their fleet because they only have one person that works on all their vehicles down there so they're they picked up an automotive student which is great so now we're gonna have two in the fire department and then you know one in Northampton PD which is good for us for the school um, just a breakdown of uh, where the students are um, <clears throat> and which shops currently plumbing has seven out electrical has six Ag Mechanics has three. Autom uh, automotive Collision has one. Animal Science has two. Automotive Tech has three. Advanced Manufacturing has two. Um, Health Tech has five. Carpentry has four. So that's the breakdown of our students now. I hear a lot of chatter from the juniors already talking about it because before you know it, you know, it's going to be the 91st day. I mean, we're already going in November. Um, I will start going out to the shops and talking to the juniors in their uh, related class to let them know what the eligibility is, what the standards are for them to get out, and hopefully if they're, they're behind the eight ball in some of their classes, they can get their grades up before they have to appeal to Mr. Bianca and myself to try to go out on an appeal. Go ahead. Um, first, I enjoyed seeing your picture on social media at that farm. Oh. <laughs> did you enjoy the experience yeah. there <laughs> as much as it looked like you did? Um, and second, I'm wondering, did you notice that there was any kind of dip in participation, um, in co-op participation during the pandemic? No, um, actually it didn't. Okay. Um, so the like, only dip we had is when the pandemic hit, um, all the vocational <coughs> schools, uh, Dr. Lincoln Hooker told me that they were <coughs> stopping co-op. Right. So we had to call the employers and tell them that if they wanted to keep the student as an employee, they could but they wouldn't be falling under Chapter 74. So some of the shop areas, they wouldn't be able to use those kids in the same capacity that they were using them while they were out under Chapter 74. A lot of them stayed on, but then as soon as that ended, everybody went back to work. Now, the participation's high. There's lots of people calling. I left three or four messages for chat over the carpentry. <coughs> There's just a lot of people calling looking for kids. Great. So we, we have a lot of repeat employers that come back every year, and they want to grab the best kid out of each shop. They usually try to get the best kid first, and then they go from there. <clears throat> so that's it for co-op. Uh, Sports-wise, I'll just give you a rundown. Um, great participation this year. Uh, the football team's got 51 kids playing on a team. Boys soccer has 18. 
Girls soccer has 17. Girls volleyball has 28. The cheer team has eight. And cross country has eight. So there's 130 students participating in sports. Um, just to give you an overall where the, where the teams are right now, football team's struggling, but all the kids are hanging in there. They're working hard. They had a couple close games. Thought they were going to squeak it out, but they didn't. So they're 0-6 right now. they got three games left. And then they'll get a couple consolation games in the MIA playoffs. Um, right now they're ranked 38th in the state. Our girls' soccer team currently is 10-1. and They're playing right now. They have two games left. They're ranked 33 in the state. They're trying to hopefully get bumped into 32 so they can participate in the, in the top 32 for the state tournament. They're ranked second currently right now, and I don't see anybody bumping them in the Massachusetts Vocational Athletic Directors Association. They have a small tournament for vocational, and they're ranked second. And I don't see them moving there, so they're going to participate in that. And they're ranked fifth right now in Western Mass. Um, if they win tonight and they're up one nothing, um, they will win our first girls title ever league title. So, and they also got a great shot to uh, to win the Massachusetts vocational small championship. Uh, boys team, we got a new coach Max Wider moved on this year, but we hired Ryan Del Pena, one of the new PE teachers. He's doing a great job with the kids. Anytime a new coach comes in, you know, there's a, it's a different, it's a different uh, you know, operation for the kids to be dealing with, different coaching style. But they're currently 7, 5, and 1. They have one game left. Their senior game's tonight at 6 o'clock. Um, they're ranked 58, so they won't, they won't make it into the state tournament. But they're ranked 5th in the vocational tournament. I feel like if they win tonight, they could possibly move into the 4th spot because they take the top 4 teams. So 1 plays 4 two plays, three, and then they play. It's a two-day tournament, and they finish the next day. So they might be able to squeak into that spot. Uh, they're ranked seventh in Western Mass right now. Cross-country team is four and five. They got three meets left. They're ranked fifth in their league. The cross-country team's a little bit different. It's kind of, they just have their own Western Mass running event. Um, and then there's also a small Volk running event that our students will also participate in. Uh, girls volleyball team finished up their season last night. Um, they finished up eight, eight and ten. They're ranked 48th, so they won't make it into the 32 playoff for the state. But they're ranked eighth in Western Mass, so they'll end up playing the one seed, which is going to be a little rough for them. But they'll move on and they'll get another game after that. So that's pretty much a breakdown of what's going on with sports for this year. I know it wasn't early, but kind of gives you what's going on right now currently and we're going to be wrapping up at the end of this week with the regular league play and then move on from there. If you would pass on from the trustees, uh, thank all your coaches for the great job they're doing, yeah. your new people, and you know, thank the students because they're the ones that are that are out there putting in the effort and just yeah. tell them we do recognize them and we appreciate that. Yeah. And I know all the parents all say it, I'm sure Dr. Lincoln Hooker and Mr. Bianca hear it, all the, all the parents are happy that there's no user fees thanks to you. It's huge for us because I don't know how many athletes. I don't think we'd have 100 athletes playing sports if we had user fees. So I thank the board for, you know, giving us enough budget to cover them playing and all the equipment they need and everything else. So that's all I got. Thank you, Joe. I have a question. Yep. Um, you mentioned ranking. So yep. What's the ranking based on, Joe? So the rankings is pretty difficult for me to break down. I guess you could probably have a longer conversation with Dr. Lickenhart because he knows it real well. But the rankings, so the, the, the state went to a whole different ranking style. We used to use a Walker system, which was a lot easier for people to figure out. But now the MIA has a ranking where they take it just like the NCAAs. They take the top 32, and you have to make it into that top 32 to play. So when you say, are we compared against all the other schools, including regular high schools? Yes. And so, so there's under, different under divisions. the umbrella, the MIAA is yep. what it's MIAA. Called. So there's different divisions, and each yeah. division has a ranking of 32. So when I tell you where they are, there's a few teams that are going to get in that top 32, and then there's some that are not even close. But then we always used to have a Western Mass playoff, which is through the PVAC, which is our league play. Um, so they kind of got away with that when they did the state tournaments. So now we've gone back to a small Western Mass playoff, which is more conclusive for us to get into. You know, being in the top eight, so one plays eight, and then it goes from there. Quarterfinals, semifinals, and then the finals. And then the big thing I always tell our kids, it's, it's huge for us to go to the vocational tournament. 
I feel like the vocational tournament to my to me in the vocational schools is like winning the Western Mass Championship. Right. Because you're playing on an even field. You're, you're playing, playing with the same size, similar schools, because they have a large division and a small division. <clears throat> so last year the boys team won it for the first time ever for baseball. So that, that's huge for us. My question was um, uh, your perspective on the reorganization that um, under MIAA, do you, in your professional opinion, has it benefited Smith Vocational, hurt Smith Vocational, a little of both? What's your assessment so uh, far? It's pretty much a little bit of both, but it, it, it's very hard for us. I don't know if we could ever, my own opinion is win a state championship. Just because of the, the different factors that they use, and, and I'd have to sit down with you like individually and show you how it breaks down. Right. It's pretty complicated. It's very. Complicated. It's not just the easy rubric that they use. Right. They use size of school. Yeah. And, and Joe sits on a wrestling committee with me at the MIA. They took away the the benefiting factor of being a vocational school, so they would let you drop down. They took that away. So there, there's a. It's tough for a vocational school to win a state right. championship in the MIA. Are our teams traveling further now than they yes. were before? Yes. Yep. And so that's the thing. That's the big thing for us. We travel a lot to the Berkshires, and it's everybody. It's not just us. Yeah. So I don't know who it was in the Berkshires. I don't know. It was one of them. Mount, Mount Greylock? Monument Tech. Mountain? McCann Tech? Tech had to, huh? You're talking about the one that had to go all the way to Nantucket? Yeah, Nantucket. somebody had to go all the way to Nantucket to play oh. in the state tournament. So they you talk about a small vocational <laughs> school with money having to send those kids on a not from, from the Berkshires, that's about a four hour ride to even get on a ferry and then go over to the to the island. Yeah. And they didn't stay there, they had to come back and drive back. <laughs> so those kids were on a bus for eight plus hours, then on a boat for at least 45 minutes to an hour, twice. Yeah. Yeah. So that, it, it really is a very unfair advantage for, I, I don't like the system to be honest with you, and but they don't, there's not much I can do to change that. They don't come to us, we have to go to them. It's going to be very rare that we could be a high enough seed that they would come to us. And how do our athletes feel about the longer travel time? Um, I don't think they mind it more than the co coaches mind it. It's a long day. Yeah, I think the coaches, because the problem with us is that it, it's been great because we've been getting some yellow buses, but ever since the pandemic, it's been tough for us to get a yellow bus for every game. Yeah. So when I have a coach driving a 14-passenger bus that we have from here going an hour, hour and a half, yeah. you know, up there and back. Uh, it's not a benefit for a coach to be driving the bus. No. And that's why we went to the yellow buses, because they can't talk to the kids, they can't talk about the game, because um, they're just focusing on driving the bus. Yeah. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, property subcommittee report. Uh, <coughs> three o'clock. Our main focus of the meeting was our rebuilding or building a new horticulture building due to the loss in the fire. <coughs> and we're starting to uh, <coughs> get to a focus point where we know where we'd like to go and what we can afford. Uh, our vision is still a little more than we, we think we can afford, but we're getting there. And we've tasked our uh, the architectural firm, Dietz & Company, uh, who we hired to help us through this process. And this is not our <coughs> architect moving forward when we do go to construction, but it's the first step so we can figure out what we can do and what we can't do. Um, so our next meeting is... Uh, uh, November 15th at 3 o'clock that was the main part of our uh, meeting today but I also want to uh, keep on top of the other issues of the property uh, the school owns a lot of property and the stewards of a lot of property uh, one thing that just came to mind that we didn't talk about was the really the, uh, the Northampton State Hospital property but that will get back in focus uh, we talked about the forestry building up at the <coughs> off of Route 9 and what you could say the VA property, but it's not the VA property. We do own the property, so we need to get that facility back in more operation and more use than what it's been used for recently. Um, the other main projects are 
Well, <clears throat> there's a uh, an R and R window tractor trailer box here full of windows <clears throat> for the window replacements on a couple buildings. And that'll happen uh, Christmas break, February and April break. Uh, buildings A and B, uh, AC for building C. It's anticipated for next February and April. Uh, we've had some back and forth with the city and city stepped in on some uh, uh, energy concerns and, and uh, that sort of thing. So that's being re-looked at. Uh, one other project that's in the work is the sidewalks project that was funded through capital improvements. Um, and we have the uh, animal science building, the old GCC. Uh, building the old way back the rec building that uh, is in the works of being <coughs> converted into program space instructional classroom space um, the space has been demoed out the materials being uh, is ordered and being delivered to start building the walls for the new programs and that work will be done in house with the, uh, the construction shops being uh, carpentry, uh, plumbing, and electrical. Um, there's some issue with the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it's an older term, uh, the apple storage area in one of the barns facing the, uh, the, the, the cow fields. Uh, there's some rotted floor joists and that's um, been in the works on getting that replaced and uh, bids were accepted and there's an issue with the bidding process so that may be thrown out and rebid. Uh, the, the, the farm up on Birds Pits Road, the greenhouse has been, well, what's called the greenhouse, not necessarily being used as a greenhouse, is uh, been reskinned and used as storage because the existing building there that's a, a concrete block building with a corrugated metal roof is uh, needs repairs the roof's leaking and so uh, Tim and his crew and the farm techs are slowly working on putting that back in shape and um, there's always, always a lot of stuff going on here and a lot of moving parts and I just want to keep that in focus and so we've redeveloped under Andy's direction the property subcommittees and other subcommittees. So uh, we're going to hear this more often on what else is going on on campus and off campus. That's it for now. What? No shortage of work. It sounds like. <coughs> no, no, no shortage of work. And I probably didn't touch on everything. Okay. Thank you. Jumping right in, I'm trying to make the highlights a little bit more efficient. Uh, I think we all know there's meetings that dictate our lives. So I pull out a lot of the meetings that we always have between uh, Joe's bat meetings, uh, my leadership meetings. You know those are happening, so there's really no need to the highlights. So, you know, main highlights that we want to focus on. Uh, thank you, Dr. Spencer Robinson, highlighting the, the General Advisory Committee uh, meeting. Actually, let me step back. This was the General Advisory Committee meeting back on September 21st. Uh, the General Advisory are the chairpersons of each of the program advisories. Uh, we meet in the morning, and uh, that particular meeting, uh, we were receiving nominations for the new chairperson for the General Advisory Committee. And uh, as a reminder for the board, uh, the General Advisory Committee did vote on a new chairperson. Uh, she represents co cosmetology, is uh, Kendra. Uh, Kendra Cross. Uh, she's been on the advisory since she, her junior year in high school. Uh, so she's uh, definitely committed to the school. Uh, she is currently practicing, owns her own salon, I believe, over in Amherst. Uh, and, and I do want to thank uh, Mr. Florio for his many years of service uh, as the chairperson. So that all happened back in late September. We had the back to school night uh, the following night on September 22nd. And again, back to school night is what we call uh, basically the traditional schools call open house. Uh, we call it back to school night because our open house is in early November. That's where we open up the campus for the community, for potential uh, st middle school students and families to come here, check out the school, check out the programming to see if they want to come here. So uh, what we call back to school night, most families would understand is open house. 
On the 27th, uh, I was able to uh, join with, with Mr. Bianca and Ms. Charity. We went over to Westfield Tech, and uh, we did receive the Skills Capital Grant. Uh, that is $2.1 million. Uh, there was a lovely article in the Gazette uh, highlighting it. Uh, so again, the, the main focus of the $2.1 million Skills Capital Grant was for horticulture and was for animal science. And uh, it is a bit of a shell game. So when we were talking to the state after the fire, uh, the state reminded me or let me know about this potential Skills Capital Grant. And I was talking about the vision that we have around animal science, around campaigning animals, how I was prepared to advocate to the board for some money to do all the renovations that we're beginning to do uh, with the former GCC building and so on and so forth. The state said, well, if you go for the grant, you can apply the grant for that particular facility upgrades and then take the money that you were earmarking for those upgrades and apply that to the horticulture rebuild. Uh, so that was sort of our vision that we were talking about as a board. Uh, this is becoming a reality. So that $2.1 million, $600,000 of that can be applied to the animal science revision. So uh, as Mr. Aquadro mentioned, uh, we're beginning to do the work down in the former GCC building. Once that's done, we can move the students in there for the relit classrooms. That will then lead us to the next step, which is a demo and reconstruction of the uh, current pig slash nursery barn. Uh, that's going to become the, the canine uh, kenneling and, and uh, dog salon, uh, basically, space. So staff will, will have the opportunity to bring the dogs in during the work day. Our students will be able to work with the dogs throughout the day. We'll also have to then renovate the current MS class, uh, the MS barn classroom. That's going to turn into the future pocket pet laboratory. Uh, so what is a pocket pet? Uh, I'm being told that is your, your mice and your gerbils and your hamsters and exactly uh, the one space I don't want to be in on campus. Uh, so that bears uh, all, all your pocket pets, uh, snakes. So um, a lot of work's happening down back uh, as we expand animal science. Uh, a lot, uh, most of that will be student labor driven, and it is funded by that particular grant, the Skills Capital Grant which again, indirectly benefits us when we come to the horticulture building, which I'll talk about in a minute. On the 28th, I had a mob of board of directors meeting, fine. Uh, October 3rd, we had, uh, there was a faculty meeting, thank you to Mr. Bianco. Uh, this has been a tradition that we started over the last couple of years, recognizing the, the individual staff members who've been here for a long time. So we hand out service awards, uh, 10 year, 20 year, 25, and even 30 years. Uh, so the fact that somebody uh, is young enough to start here and then stay here for 30 years, I think it's quite impressive. So you know, when I talk about dying and, and going to heaven when I, I come here, uh, it's a true testament. I mean that. Uh, people realize that this is a wonderful place to work. They don't want to leave. And I joke at this particular ceremony, we even have individuals who think the grass is greener on the other side. Uh, they leave us and then they come back uh, and, and out in, their, in that realm of, of the upper echelon as far as service. So uh, again, I think that speaks volumes. Uh, we had no school on October 10th. On the 12th, I just want to highlight this <coughs> meeting. Uh, thank you to Mr. Kaley for making these connections happen. Uh, but Kobe Gardner Levine, he is a uh, representative for U.S. Representative McGovern's office here in Northampton. Uh, Kobe set up a meeting with us along with a USDA rep and to talk about potential grant funding, financial support through the USDA to try to support our culture. Uh, there were some possibilities. Uh, unfortunately, the demographics, and this is the challenge that we have constantly here at Smith. Because Smith Vocational is based in Northampton, any grant agency out there, they look at us as a sort of an entity of Northampton. So when they look at the demographics of Northampton, we're too affluent. Uh, so this particular agency that, uh, that we're talking to, they typically deal with low-income rural communities when they're trying to, de to develop agricultural opportunities. The challenge, and I push back on, on this representative, and I share all the data, thank you to Deb. Uh, yes, we live in the city of Northampton, but we truly serve students from everywhere. 80% uh, of our students come from outside of Northampton. Many of the students, where they live, those are the communities that this particular agency directly serves. So is there a workaround? So uh, they're looking into it, see if they can you know, figure out a way to support us. Uh, but that is the uphill battle, that is the headwind that we constantly fight when it comes to grant funding. Uh, based on where we are versus who we serve. On the 12th, now program advisory meetings, so again, thank you uh, for the, the wonderful words. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the program advisories, uh, if you have a chance, yes, walk around, see them. Uh, I think it's half the reason why we offer a relevant and rigorous education, as, as I said that evening to the advisory members. As a superintendent, as administrators, even as the, the vocational instructors who were in the trade at one point, that's how they were eligible to become a teacher, 
they're out of the trade long enough where we begin to lose touch. At what is the current practice? What are the best practices and best ways to do things in the field? Well, by having current industry members on the advisory, giving us those recommendations on what we have to teach, how we're supposed to teach, and what equipment we're supposed to have in front of the students, having that information, we can make sure that we stay out in front uh, and providing that education that the students deserve. So that is the program advisory meeting that happened last, last week. And then last Friday, I did host the associate commission, one of the associate commissioners of Jesse, uh, Liz Bennett, and the old colony regional voc tech superintendent, Aaron Polanski. Uh, this is sort of a follow-up to the coffee with commissioner meeting I had back in September. Uh, it looks like this will become sort of the new norm. Uh, the three of us will meet, and we promise the next time we'll, I'll travel down to Old Colony, which is southeastern part of the state. Uh, but it was a great conversation talking about some high-level uh, things at, at the education level around voc ed looking at some of the framework, revisions, and updates, and then uh, we did a tour, and we did a selfie in front of the cow, so, uh, anyways, that was that. <coughs> so, Mr. Rogers did a great job highlighting the, the horticultural building, uh, I just, more from the financial getting to the weeds, uh, so the board is aware of where we are budget-wise. Uh, yes, the demolition was done, uh, so if you have a chance, I think last meeting I, I mentioned how Mr. Einsbach's classroom is now like an outdoor space uh, with all of that taken down. But with the finances, some main pots that we're getting money from. The first pot is the, the initial insurance settlement for the building, approximately $900,000 uh, that we'll be receiving from the insurance company because of the damaged, damaged portion of the building. So that goes into potential rebuild. I already mentioned the $2.1 million skills capital grant, 600,000 of that can go towards facility upgrades, but again, the shell game. So that 600000 goes to animal science to deal with the renovations, which frees up me standing in front of you as a board to ask if we can use upwards of $600,000 from tuition revolving to go towards the rebuild. Currently this week, I think my life, uh, and Mr. Bianca's life, and the Chardier's life has been spent in Mr. Bianca's office uh, writing this very large grant. This is the biggest grant we've, we've gone for. Uh, this is the latest round of the skills capital grant. It is due this Friday, so we will be notified, hopefully, early to mid-December, uh, if we are awarded this big grant. The difference in this particular grant is 70% of that $5 million can be applied to facility upgrades, compared to the 30% of that $2.1 million. So if we ask for $5 million, that means $3.5 million of that grant can go towards the horticulture rebuild, and it would be directly towards the horticulture rebuild. There's no shell game this time. The four programs that we're asking for, as a reminder, uh, you were voted on this last month as a board. We're looking at horticulture for obvious reasons, ag mechanics, specifically around welding, improving the welding education there, cabinet making, and advanced manufacturing. Lots of equipment and tools. This is some good news. Probably the, the one piece of good news that we received through this whole process. Uh, we were told from day one that our insurance policy for lost equipment uh, and tools was approximately 238000 give or take. Uh, we received a settlement from the insurance company of 411000 So uh, I think Crystal and I looked at each other like, what is wrong here? Those numbers don't add up. Uh, Crystal reached out to Joe Cook at the city who confirmed, no, that's, that's accurate. So we did receive more money than we were anticipating when it comes to the lost equipment, which is great. Talking in the property subcommittee t uh, meeting today, most likely, we're not going to have to use that money very much in replacing the last tools and equipment because between the donations from community members and with all these grants that we're receiving, we have been able to replace most of the equipment and the tools. So that $411,000 will go a long ways when it comes to the building uh, rebuild. And finally, <coughs> donations, I want to thank uh, Deb for doing this. Uh, so there's a spreadsheet that we've been tracking with all the donations coming in, and we had it sort of grouped together for the longest time between gift cards and monetary donations. Now obviously we know the, mo the gift cards we can't apply to construction costs, and uh, the gift cards will allow us to help replace lost tools and equipment, but when we pull out actual monetary donations, as of yesterday morning, we were at $39,659.37, uh, strictly in, in cash donations to the school for community members. Uh, the last one I, I just want to thank, I, I sent out a personal thank you to, was Smith Charities, uh, who has a, obviously a strong connection uh, to the school. Uh, Smith Charities, a couple months ago, reached out to me asking me for some very specifics around the fire, insurance coverage, so on and so forth. I responded, gave all the, all the information. They cut a check for $8,500 uh, recently, so that's part of that $39,000. So you add all of that up, and we're about $5.4 million. 
that's the big pot. Uh, as Mr. Okawajo said, uh, these architects, they gave us three conceptual designs today. Uh, the first two take the existing structure that is remaining and, and working around it. The third option was taking it all down and, and building new, which seems kind of productive, okay? Uh, we already have part of the structure, why don't we save that and work around it? But that makes things less efficient, which means we'd have a larger square foot building at the end of the day if we save what is still there to get the same usage. So it ends up being a bigger building, if that makes sense. And the cost is more. If we take it all down, we can get the same usage at just over a thousand square feet less, and the construction cost most likely would be less because the design could be much simpler. Uh, the, the first drawing that they, they shared with us today uh, is a basic rectangle. Okay, so it's a simple roof system, uh, basic walls. Uh, you know, you start doing all these the fancy uh, wall systems where you have too many different corners. It takes more material, more labor, and, and the costs go up. So. Right now, we're playing with this idea of uh, a simple design. Uh, yes, it means taking everything down and, and starting fresh, but we could save some money in the construction costs. Obviously, there's a cost that goes up, and that's demolition. You know, we have to take down the rest of the building. So even accounting for the higher cost in demolition, we're probably still ahead if we take it all down and build new. <coughs> the problem is 5.4 million, this is high end 5.4 million, and we already have to account for the current demolition that we already completed. We have to cover that cost. And uh, the architecture fees that we're already paying for right now, uh, along with other fees. So that 5.4, we can't totally apply to construction costs. I think as a board, we have to recognize that. Option three today, take everything down, build new. I, I think on the high end, with all the additional costs, Mr. Crodger, tell me if I'm wrong, probably close to $6 million. So we're, we're close. Okay, we're much closer than where we were back in May and June, so I can begin to sleep a little more comfortably at night. But the facts remain, a very simple building, the only addition to this building design, and I made, made it known to the, the community today, the only addition in this potential space compared to what we already have or had is one extra classroom. Garage space is the same. We go from two classrooms to three classrooms, the same head house, uh, retail space for the greenhouse, um, same office space, same bathrooms, locker space. We're not asking for a Taj Mahal. We're simply asking for what we had plus one classroom. And uh, we're looking at, we're pushing most likely $6 million. Uh, so where do we find 500 to a million dollars? That was sort of what we began to talk about this afternoon. Uh, and that's gonna be the big question as a board we have to figure out. But I'm more comfortable trying to figure out how do we find 500,000 to a million than I was looking to 10 to 15 million months ago. So questions on this is a big topic, but any initial questions, comments? So you're, you're talking about raising the entire everything. Plus the storage bar next to it. Wow. So like where the aquaponics and hydroponics is or is that so the first two designs kept all of that remaining. The third design that we're sort of leaning towards right now, with, with some movement, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. We can move the pieces around but still fit within that rectangle. Uh, the greenhouse would have to be moved. Uh, part of the initial construction cost estimates was a new greenhouse, but we talked about it today, that that greenhouse actually was replaced a few years ago through a skill scalpel grant. Uh, is there a way to either, hopefully Mr. Smith has a way to lift it up, and just like move it, or take it apart and then rebuild it. So hopefully use the same system, but just in a new location. The only thing new would be uh, the new concrete slab. But the walls and the mechanisms and all the equipment would be the same. So a whole new building for less cost than just repairing, rebuilding the fraction of the Wow. And do you know how the horticulture teachers feel about that? Like, is there any sentimental attachment to the space? Or, no? I think, I can't speak for them. They're not here. Uh, I think the sentimental value is the items in the building rather than the building itself. Okay. Uh, I'm just speculating. We talked about the 1970s wall paneling that we want to try to save some of that. It's vintage. <laughs> and didn't you just refresh all the lockers on campus? Um, uh, any preliminary ideas about the um, half a million dollars? 
for that? Two, two initial time? thoughts. And, and this is totally out of turn and just brainstorming. Uh, one would be tuition revolving. You know, what do we have available? Uh, we keep dipping into it. And then the second one would be a potential small bond. Looking at the city a little bit, but we have cell tower revenue. Mm -hmm. You know, what could what can we afford if we use cell tower revenue to pay a bond without leaning on the city, without going to the, the city communities? I'm I'm really opposed <coughs> on the one record. Really opposed using the capital assessment regulation to, to charge the city communities uh, for this particular project. We all know there's a, a bigger project we have to deal with at some point. Uh, many of these small towns, they send students here at a high cost, plus transportation, and many times those towns are paying a tuition for programs that are not horticulture. So how is it right for that town to pay a horticulture rebuild when there's no students from that town that are enrolled in? <coughs> so I'm leery of going down that road. So I think there are ways to close the gap internally for the most part. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, Staffing updates, and then get into my evaluation. So I just want to share with the board, uh, thank you to the board during the budget season. Uh, we have proposed a grant writer. At the time, it was a, a part 0.5 FTE halftime grant writer. Uh, we're not getting anybody uh, who is qualified or overly qualified, or they're currently a grant writer, or they own their own business, and there's potential conflicts of interest. So uh, I've, I've shared with Crystal, uh, let's be posed as a, a full-time, a, a one FTE, uh, thinking that we'll get a more qualified candidate and uh, take some of the load off. Again, I joke about it, but in all seriousness, uh, we're going to lose a principal and vocational director if I keep making the right grants. Uh, it takes a lot of time uh, and a lot of effort, and running a grant takes away from being a principal. Uh, so we definitely need somebody to, to step in. The next one is uh, HR and payroll. You may have seen the posting go out. Uh, we had a resignation. And as I, I told the admin team, anytime somebody leaves, it's a chance for us to look ourselves in the mirror and say, how do we want to move forward? Uh, is there anything we want to change in, in the new position? So we took that opportunity. We looked at that, that current role. And uh, we realized that there were a lot of HR duties that other individuals are, are taking on. I'm going to keep picking on Mr. Bianco. But there's a lot of HR responsibilities that he takes on as a principal that are outside of his principal duties. You know, as a high school principal, he does have the authority to hire and fire staff and evaluate staff, obviously, but there's more HR duties and above and beyond that that we can take off of this plate. Uh, we take the, uh, we use GCN trainings. It's basically all of our mandated staff PD uh, training. <coughs> right now that falls on the shoulders of, of Mr. Parks. That's really an HR role. Why can't HR oversee all of those training? So uh, consolidating all of that uh, and, and posting it for this particular position, I believe tomorrow there's three interviews, three qualified uh, candidates, so very hopeful that we'll have somebody might come out of that, that process and we can finally fill that, that position. Uh, and again, the White House has been busy. They've all picked up the slack. Uh, it's been a busy 12 months between medical issues and resignations. I, I, I'm looking at Deb now saying you know, thank you to Deb and, and to Heidi and Kate and Crystal. Uh, so it's done all this work. And finally, the, the uh, a position that I am proposing moving forward on this uh, is an animal care technician. So for those who are unaware, uh, the farm operations, we have instructors. They're the teachers in the, in the classroom teaching the students. Uh, but we also have full-time farm techs. And uh, we currently have three farm techs. Think of a farm tech as a farm hand on, on like a private farm. Or if you're familiar with the school setting, your custodians, your facilities who maintain that space, who maintain that, the property of the farm. Uh, but running a farm means animals, so they also, they're also feeding the animals and caring for the animals and so on and so forth outside the school day. Uh, it's a challenge uh, to, to do all of this. As Mr. Quadro said, we have a lot of property, a lot of maintenance going on, and those three farm techs are out nonstop. Uh, and we have a growing herd of, of uh, animals, and we're going to continue to grow. We have those pocket pets and, and the dogs. There's a, a greater need for the farm techs. So we've been talking about adding a fourth farm tech for a while now. But some internal discussions, a lot of review, communication, so on and so forth. We really do feel, and I stand firmly on this, I think the biggest concern we have on campus operation-wise is the farm. And we need to have all hands on deck to make sure we're doing the best possible service to the farm, which ultimately means for the students. So I have told the, the staff we're going to move to uh, two different lanes. We're going to have the traditional farm tech lane, and we're going to have an animal care tech lane. 
uh, and, and sort of break that position out into two. So the farm tech lane is more of your, your traditional farm hand, that, that traditional custodian who's maintaining the buildings, maintaining the fields, doing all the hanging, so on and so forth. You have the animal care tech lane, which is truly caring for the animals, the feeding, the watering, the bedding, uh, dealing with the vet, so on and so forth. And most likely have a, a tighter communication relationship with the instructors. Because the instructors with the students, they're more uh, interested, obviously, so with the animals. How are the farm techs working with the instructional staff to make sure the animals are ready to go and available for the students? Having that animal care tech working more directly with the instructors, I think, will make a, a better communication uh, relationship there. <clears throat> so we're looking at hiring that fourth in individual. We're finalizing a job description with the three internals. We're going to see where they fall and you know, what lane do they want to be in. Do they want to remain in that farm tech lane? Do any of them have an interest to slide over to the animal care tech lane? I think out of respect to those three individuals, they should have the right to decide where they want to be. And then we will post externally for whatever is open, whether it's a farm tech or an animal care tech. And we've had conversations with the instructors, with, the, uh, with Mr. Smith, with Admin. Uh, I think we've all bought into this is well overdue. If you talk to, I'm not the historian, it sounds like many years ago this was sort of the model that we had here at Smith, and, and other institutions have had this as well. If you mass, a very similar model. So. so you're proposing a fourth position? Yep. Um, do you have any Does that require our approval or not in terms of the budget, ultimately? You approve the budget. Yeah. Um, we will have to find the money. And, uh, and talking to Crystal, I can't propose this unless we have the money. And Crystal told me, "Don't worry. You know, we, we can have the money is available." Uh, I'm not asking for any additional money out of tuition revolving to balance the budget. Uh, the other additional thing is we have more revenue coming in through non-resident tuition from what we budgeted, so we, we know we have the available money. I asked, uh, this makes perfect sense to me, and, and wonderful advocacy on your part, for sure. And I understand we're growing um, the whole part of the campus and the animal science program. Um, but uh, folks here remember probably back in April, I think, when we were approving the budget where um, I was advocating for uh, longevity benefits in all of the employee contracts. Um, just for that uh, sort of more equitable approach and we didn't have the money at the time and so we agreed to look at the budget in February to see if we had that money. Um, so thinking that we have the money for this, my wonder is do we have money for those longevity bon um, benefits? Um, so putting that out there now, it, it's definitely in my mind um, another, it's important, you know, it's not something that's important to me because I think those employees don't have um, they're not unionized, so they don't have the union to advocate for them. So I'm not actually sure how those contracts get negotiated, but wanting to advocate for that longevity benefit in that, you know, you do the service awards, is, which you said is a record, and it's so good for the school to have that kind of dedication. Um, but another question in my mind is um, if, I, I know because it's a new position, it can certainly be eliminated in future budgets, but if we were to include it in next year's budget, I don't know if we've received a request to um, bargain the Unit H contract yet, um, and I don't know when we'll be renegotiating the contracts for our um, two um, top uh, district administrators. Um, but I think that the pay for the superintendent and the principal are not in line with other um, superintendents and principals where, where they should be, so just wanting to, you know, um, do better by those two positions, how can we afford all that, I guess, is my question. And I know that enrollment is growing, um, but I don't I think I want to just sort of put all that out there. They're in my mind. And I, I know they're in my mind, Abbott's mind. Those are conversations we have all the time. Um, there's a lot I can chew on there. Um, I would say the longevity, philosophically, I am supportive of longevity across the board. My question to the board would be, how do we define equity? Um, and I, I shared you know, this cartoon. I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with this. I, I, I'm not a great storyteller. Uh, but you have three kids, OK? You have this uh, very young elementary school kid. You have a middle school kid, and you have a high school kid. So all different heights. And they're in the outfield, beyond the outfield wall, trying to watch a baseball game. And the tall kid, me, I'm just looking over the fence. I can see the game, but barely. 
Okay, the middle school kid is almost to the top of the fence but can't see over. And then you have the elementary school kid who's just way too short but can't watch the game. So what is equitable? What is equity? Is it giving them all the same size stool? So then me, the tall high school kid, I'm way over the fence. I'm probably too tall. I'm probably fear fearful I'm going to fall over the fence. Okay? you got the middle school kid who now is at the right height, can really enjoy the game. And an elementary school kid is just now peering over the fence. Is that equity? They all have the same size stool. Or is equitable different size stools that allow the three individuals to have the same height overall? Uh, I, that's my, I'm, I struggle with that, that debate. Uh, I'm not sure why I support longevity. Should longevity be a flat rate, to, no matter who you are, okay, your, your job title, or should it be contingent on who you are as a job title? Your work year, some people work a school year, some people work year round. I'm open to that dialogue. I, I want to have the board have really chew on that. Um, but longevity as a, in principle, I fully support. So, I know that doesn't answer the question. Uh, as far as the, the, the salaries, Unit H, um, they should be opening up this fall, this year's <coughs> time. Um, so this is their final year. Uh, so we'll be negotiating this year for, with Unit H. And the individual contracts, I'm with you. And again, we talked about this even through Unit D. Uh, that there's, I don't want to call them the last ceilings, but any time we, we support a job category, they begin to bump up to the next level category, and it's a, a domino effect. And it's, it's a challenge to, to balance all of that. I'm not sure that answers the question. But. Thank you. So my goals. Uh, thank you to, to Dr. Spencer Robinson highlighting the model. I can see a lot of this. So yes, there's uh, there's four indicators, one from each standard uh, that we're sitting down with Dr. Spencer Robinson. We identified uh, one indicator from each of those uh, standards, and then two of those four indicators uh, were sort of the basis of my two goals. So as a reminder, standard one is instructional leadership. We chose indicator 1B, which is instruction. And I'll just read it just for the record. Uh, I took the language around proficient. What would a proficient superintendent be or look like for this indicator 1B instructions? Proficient is monitors and supports principals and instructional staff through observations and feedback to ensure the instructional practices in all settings reflect high expectations regarding content and quality of effort and work engage all students in are personalized to accommodate diverse learning styles, needs, interests, and levels of readiness. Uh, so this would be an area where I'll provide evidence uh, to share with the board uh, to highlight my, my work towards the indicator. And to remind people, um, superintendents can't be rated proficient unless this they receive a rating of proficient in this standard. Which is, it mirrors the, the, the teaching evaluation model as well. Standard two, that's that management and operation standard. Uh, we chose indicator 2A, which is environment. And again, just as a sort of a highlight, what does proficient look like for this particular indicator? Develops and, ed and executes effective plans, procedures, routines, and operational systems to address a full range of safety, health, and emotional and social needs of students throughout the district. As evidenced by orderly and efficient student entry, dismissal, meals, class transitions, <coughs> assemblies, and recess. School and district buildings that are clean, attractive, welcoming, and safe. And finally, safe and supportive learning environments for all students. Uh, so this, again, there won't be a direct goal attached to this one. Uh, there'll be evidence. However, uh, there's work that we, we've talked about as a board. We've just signed a contract around equity work. And specifically, a lot of mentoring and, and guidance for me as a superintendent. And uh, through all of that, we're looking at an equity audit, like reviewing all of our policies to make sure that we are equitable for all students. And uh, there's a uh, mindfulness. So step one in this whole work is this mindfulness work. And I'm actually working with the trainer right now, setting up uh, a dinner for next week to talk about what does this look like for mindfulness for me as, a, as the superintendent, and then how do we uh, translate that to our, our leadership team. So that would be my main focus on this particular one which ties back to the safe and, and supportive learning environment for all students. Okay, so that's standard two. The next two will tie to the goals. <clears throat> standard three is family and community engagement. We chose indicator 3C, which is communication. Proficient looks like engages in regular two-way culturally proficient communication with families and community stakeholders about student learning and performance. That is provided in multiple formats and reflects understanding of and respect for 
different families, values, <coughs> culture, and values. And again, I'll talk about the goal in a moment. And then the last standard, standard four, professional culture. We chose indicator 4C, which is also communications. Proficient looks like demonstrate strong per, uh, interpersonal written and verbal communication skills as evidenced by regular and informative outreach to staff, family, and community members in the school committee, i.e. for the trustees, in a manner that advances the work of the district, regularly seeks and considers feedback in decision making. That would be my, my second goal would be focused on that. So the two goals. Goal one, I already mentioned, uh, that's the communication, the two-way culturally uh, proficient communication. The goal is drafted, so by June of 2023, so the end of the school year, seven monthly newsletters will be shared with families in the community highlighting various aspects of the school, including academics, vocational programs, student supports, athletics, cooperative learning, and informative articles educating the greater community around Chapter 74 in career and technical education. The newsletter will use the SMORE platform, in enabling easy translation and data analysis to better understand those that read the newsletter and adapt the newsletter for the greater impact. <clears throat> this has turned into a team goal. Basically, the entire leadership team are coming together, uh, centering around how do we have this newsletter go out. Uh, so we have all of the, the admin, because I, I think I touched on most of the, the areas. We'll work together, uh, provide updates, uh, provide some education for the community. You know, what is, who is Smith? What is Smith? What is Chapter 74? Why choose a Chapter 74 program over a non-Chapter 74 program? There's a lot of communication we can have on this particular topic. So, we've begun. And my second goal around communication, uh, by June of 2023, so again, the end of the school year, eight of the monthly superintendent's reports to the Board of Trustees will include specific information that informs the Board of Trustees of current units of instruction, projects, and topics within the academic and vocational programs. This shared information will assist the Board of Trustees when accepting a budget and uh, creating and updating pertinent policy. So again, some individual conversations about the need for, and I think the highlight was the fire, looking at the horticulture program, the need for the Board of Trustees to have pertinent information, uh, not for you to make operational decisions, but for you as trustees to guide your policy making and budget processing. And for your main role, which is to supervise and monitor and evaluate the superintendent, to make sure the superintendent is doing his job or her job in, in supervising and managing the school district. So uh, my main focus here would be the communication I have to you as a board to make sure that you're well informed uh, so that you can do your job, which is evaluate me as I maintain and manage the staff. So that's the, the focus of the second goal. <coughs> donations only two this, this month. I say only two. Uh, any donation is a good donation. Uh, we received from Lynn Hamlin various cosmetology supplies and tools. And there's a whole lot of laundry list, so thank you to Lynn. And second of all, uh, Sherry Henshaw, uh, she donated a first aid kit to the Animal Science Program. Uh, she was here last weekend at the Farm Open House, and uh, through that experience, she donated a, a first aid kit, so I want to thank Sherry. I know you can't read, these are three different articles uh, recently. <clears throat> the one on the left I, I touched on a while ago is the Animal Science, uh, the grant we received for Animal Science, I think. Uh, Emily did a great job. Uh, previous life, uh, both Mr. Bianca and I knew, knew Emily. Uh, she used to work for the Palmer Journal. She was a reporter there when I worked at Monday. <coughs> Joe was at uh, in the Palmer, so uh, she's now at the Gazette. Uh, I think she does a great job. So it's nice that she reached out. She actually just reached out this afternoon for another story. So great article about the grant in animal science. The middle article, I just wanted to highlight the picture of Bob Bollinger, one of our custodians. Uh, it was a story around agriculture, around the farms, the impact. Uh, so it was great to see Bobby in the paper. And on the far right is one of those look backs. I won't read it, but the article, how many years ago? 50 years ago, there was a, I want to say dress code, but it's not a dress code. It was a, it's a dress code, but dealing with male mustaches. And the, the requirements around how big your mustache could be if you were a man. It could not drop below your, your lip there. And so, Poor man, true. Uh, the military, you would be kicked out. <laughs> uh, so, interesting to see what happens over the course of 50 years. Oh, and lastly, this was an ed editorial uh, technically authored by me. I, I do want to thank Leslie. Uh, Leslie was the one who truly wrote the editorial, uh, put my name to it. Uh, but thanking the Grange, uh, as we all know, at the last board meeting they were here, they part of the monetary donations. 
And unfortunately, the Gazette was not in attendance, so we thought the next best, best option was a letter to the editor. So thank you to Leslie for offering a, a wonderful editorial. Looking ahead again, eliminating all the, the management meetings. Uh, tomorrow, many of us will be gone the majority of the day and all evening uh, down to Marlboro. I'll be down there for a mob of officers, board of directors, and then many of the administrators will be down there for the general membership meeting. Uh, next week, I have the DASI CTE update call that happens a few times a month. And then uh, the following week, many of you, uh, I will join down at the Cape for the joint MASC MASS joint conference down at the Cape, uh, a wonderful three days down there. We come back on Friday and then that Sunday, which also happens to be daylight savings, uh, so make sure we turn the clocks back, uh, is our open house I, I mentioned a little while ago. We then have a very short week, so even though we're working on a Sunday, uh, we then get that Tuesday off because of the election and then that Friday off because of Veterans Day, and then finally we'll be back together on the 15th for the next board of trustees meeting. And with that said, I think I am off the hook. Next month we'll talk about the, the conference and we'll talk about the open house. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to turn over the bulk of uh, the start of this time to Mandy Wright, but before I do that, I do want to say that Jeff uh, texted me the girls' soccer team did win, and they are league champs. So. Wow. Yeah, all right. Yeah, pretty cool. Mandy? Awesome. Um, so for the upperclassmen, we have the juniors that are playing for their mock interviews uh, happening in December. And then student government is still kind of up in the air. But National Honor Society, they held their election today. The uh, positions will be announced, I believe, Friday. And then the Department of Transportation, as Ms. Bianca mentioned, we're having the training in last <coughs> week, so next week. And then fundraisers. Uh, still, what I said last month, um, that's what happened today, like the culinary arts promotion campaign, the criminal justice, Krispy cream don donut sale. Um, and then the FFA, they had their annual um, open house on uh, Saturday, October 8th. Uh, the FFA students sell food, paint their faces, and offer tours of the farm. They also had their annual cookie sale. And then no on November 6th, the skills group is uh, working with the Angelos. They're going to have their own fundraiser, and the funds will go to the skills student account. And that's all I have. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> um, so enrollment, we're at 566, 115 from Northampton, 20.3%. Ninth grade's at 151, 10th grade at 150, 11th grade at 135, 12th grade at 130. Um, our follow-up in house is scheduled for November 6th. That's 11 to 2. Our staff will be here from 10:30 to 2:30 for setup and takedown. Uh, we are gonna, we are back to our traditional format uh, with some adjustments. We're still going to be running the Cluster tours, I think that'll stick. Uh, we seem to be getting a lot of positive feedback around that. I think it also makes it easier to ma uh, manage. Uh, what that is is people will sign up either for automotive and ag tour, they'll sign up for the service industry, or they'll sign up for the construction uh, clusters. Um, it, tour numbers are limited, and we have an online sign up, which allows us a lot more control over who's here at any given time. Uh, prior to the pandemic, it was like a first come, first serve, and for that first hour, hour and 15 minutes or so, we were just absolutely swamped and, and, and covered all over. This lets us spread out attendees throughout the day um, and really helps, helps for a better event. Uh, we've been advertising in the newspaper, social media, still at the Hadley Movie Theater, uh, and we mailed out postcards um, into neighboring communities. Uh, as Dr. Lingenoger said, we had our fall advisory programs, and oh, that's a typo. Um, and we did have a college fair on October seventh. There was that was for eleventh through twelfth grade students. We had twenty nine schools that were represented, uh, including Holyoke Community College, American International College, UMass, MCLA, <coughs> Springfield College, UMaine, Porter Chester Institute, Elms, and the Armed Forces. Our uh, back to school night was held on September 22nd. We had a very solid, solid participation from families. I don't have exact numbers, um, but the, the cafeteria was full. It was, it was a really good night. Um, on the 30th, we had Jeej Wild's presentation. Uh, Jeej is a gentleman who comes, he's come now for probably four or five times now, 
Um, and what he talks about is the value of icebreakers, looking for an excuse to do something rather than not do it, the value of writing down your goals, uh, and the value of building a support system. He does this through uh, highlighting story uh, from when he was a child. His grandfather went off to World War II. Uh, at the time, one of the things that they did is, is when they were getting out of the Navy ships or things, they would take something off somebody's property. In this case, they took a lawn gnome. It was a big Captain Ahab style lawn gnome. The idea is that you bring it off to war with you, you take photos with it, uh, and then you would return it with a diary of the travels that this, this uh, statue went through. Uh, problem was is that they were drunk the night they took it. They couldn't remember where it was going to go back to. Uh, so they held on to it. They couldn't return it. But what they did decide to do uh, for those that made it through World War II, uh, every year they would get together and they would have a poker game at his grandfather's barn. Uh, and whoever won didn't win the money. They would all put in hundreds of dollars. That person got to choose where they were going to then go immediately that next morning and leave. So all they would show up to this poker game with their bags packed. They would put money on the table. All their families would come. Uh, but by next morning, all the all the fathers, grandfathers were gone, uh, and they were off on some adventure again with the Captain Ahab. Um, when he turned 18, his grandfather and what he collectively called his uncles turned the statue over to him, gave him the winnings, and said, get your friends and leave. So that's what they did, and they've been doing it ever since. He's in his, uh, getting close to 40 now. So the point is, is that he, he's done TED Talks and he's done other presentations, and it's really centered around that and trying to give the kids a mission to build that bucket list and get out and do stuff um, and build your group with you that's going to go and do it with you and how you're going to make each other successful. Uh, so students did a bucket list, uh, which we will actually return to them when they're seniors, and they can look at it and see uh, if they... They were able to achieve any of the stuff that they thought they were going to do when they were freshmen. Um, on, on September 30th also was Kathy Brown, a longtime English teacher. That was her official retirement date. We moved into our exploratory. Uh, this is our first week of the long shop rotation. Uh, you can see the numbers listed below. Uh, some things that are not surprises is electrical. Uh, had 65 total students that will go through it. Plumbing has 60, criminal justice 51. Our agriculture uh, shops came in uh, 54 in horticulture, excuse me, um, 46 in ag mech and 57 in animal science. Those are generally the bulk of it. A couple surprises for us, uh, 16 students only want to go through advanced manufacturing and only 11 through our health assisting program, which is a surprise to us um, as those are really up and coming. Yeah. Um, continue to be growing industries. Uh, so we're definitely going to look at that and have conversations uh, around that. And in talking with um, Rebecca Wanzik and Lauren Devine, uh, we really want to get some sort of a survey survey out to freshmen and try to get a better idea of maybe what motivated them to pick or not pick something uh, this year, just so we can try to uh, account for some of those drops in participation. Uh, personnel we have posted for an ag -Mec instructor. Uh, due to the resignation that we had and interview process. Uh, we currently have two candidates and the interview process started today. <clears throat> so pending your questions, that's my report. I have two very quick things. Um, one has to do with our student representative, and I don't know who to direct it to, but um, I know that the MASC conference, they're, in, they're encouraging us to um, let our student representatives know that on Saturday morning of a conference is for student representatives on school committees across the state. So I don't know if that's a pretty tight timeline. I apologize for the shortness of it, but um, I can get more information to whoever needs it. Or, or Ms. Carver can. It's in the brochure there. Um, but just seeing Mandy here at our meetings all the time, you know, she might enjoy that. And then the other is um, when, when um, we have the open house, um, is there a question when, I know that uh, families can apply right then and there, or students can apply right then and there. Is there a question on the application, um, how did you hear about the open house? Um, probably not, because the application isn't just necessarily <coughs> right, it's a connected to one. the open house, it's a general application. So I wonder if we could have um, a, a space for that. How did you hear about it? So we know how, what, 
which of our outreach efforts are paying off and maybe which aren't. And then I, uh, in myself, would be really interested in um, why they're interested in Smith Vocational. Uh, you know, just like what, what made them interested enough to come to the open house? I'll you know, check. Why I'll they're check considering both those. That, that choice. I think um, if I could offer a suggestion, yep. what we could do is in the future, uh, if it's not on the sign up form, yep. is ask how did they find out about it. So once oh, yeah. they're going to be forced yeah. to our website yep. to sign up. Yep. So that might be a, a better placement of that Definitely. question. Definitely. Yeah. But it, so if we could get get that information for this year, that would be excellent. I think. What type of turnout do you get for this task? Um, I did, when I give the minutes. When I, when I do my report in November, I'll be able to go back. We have the numbers going all the way back about seven years. Um, I would say over the last few years, it's definitely increased uh, to the point where, well, I don't want to be misquoting myself here. I'd have to look, but I think it's somewhere around 300 people come through the tour. Um, not, and I don't just mean 300 people, but maybe, you know, that represent probably 180 to 250 actual students because some people come through with two or three family members or some come through with just one um, but yeah I think we were over 300 last year especially remarkable the, when you consider that most families are making their school enrollment decisions in the spring right in the early spring they're starting this is <coughs> November yes that they're already thinking that far ahead it's, it's yeah, but I'll have that as part of my report. You'll be able to see the numbers going back. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> Crystal's not here this evening. Her report is in our uh, documents. Uh, Tim, facilities, please. Yeah, they don't really have too much. Rick pretty much touched on all the <laughs> topics that we have. <laughs> Take your thunder, Tim. <laughs> That's okay. You can have it anytime you want. <laughs> Perfect. And their new business. Uh, we're going to have a report from Donna. If you want to come up, Donna, and talk to us about some work that we need to do here at the school. Can I just lead off a little bit? And oh, please, Is that okay? Yeah. First of all, I also just want to apologize that I wasn't here last month. Um, one, because I very much enjoy these meetings. I also wanted to welcome Dr. Grayson Campbell for her first meeting, um, and also because this item was on that agenda. And it's a um, it's a pretty timely item, um, so I'm sorry that it's been delayed a month because I'm excited, so I apologize for that. Um, we have a really significant situation here on Locust Street over by um, at the bottom corner of the field um, where where the stormwater flow from the campus goes into, um, into the city drainage system, um, and it is undermining the roadway. So unless you have never driven in the last, say, nine, ten months um, towards Florence from here, um, you will be familiar with the fact that there is a large plate that you bounce over every time. And um, that is there because um, the manhole is collapsing underneath it. And the plate is sort of holding it together, but won't be able to do it for much longer. So um, I'm very happy that Director Donald Scully is here, uh, Director of the DPW, here this evening to talk about this and can talk about what has brought us to this point. Um, and the plan to uh, to mitigate the situation. And I'm also happy to talk about and to really encourage um, Smith to, to submit um, stormwater mitigation um, projects to the Capital Improvement Program. Um, uh, and preferably, if we could get that going this year, that would be great. So, um, you know, we're, we're really happy to talk about this, but this is a, a pretty critical situation we're in. So, um, thank you, Director Lascalia, for being here. Thanks for the introduction, Mayor. I appreciate it. So, Donna Lascalia from the DPW, for those who don't know me. Um, so, Mayor sort of set the stage. Um, we have uh, what I would call an undersized drainage system um, down Locust Street right now. It's an 18-inch pipe. Um, and what is happening is, is that uh, Smith's, Smith Oaks campus um, has a huge amount of impervious surface. Um, and, and just about half of the acreage is impervious. And all of the stormwater 
is flowing to the to the front corner behind me and that way I think based on how I'm sitting I'm a little turned around here um, and and what's happening is the there is a uh, a manhole just outside the city right of way where that plate is in the roadway so I'm assuming everyone knows where the plate is um, and so what's happening is that manhole is connected to the city system by a 24 inch pipe so we have an 18 inch pipe that's running east and west down Locust Street. So Smith Vokes flow is coming in a 24 inch pipe into our system that has an 18 inch pipe. So mathematically, uh, you can imagine that doesn't work. So what's happening is during high flow events, so when, when we get an excessive amount of, of rain, our system, the city's system, is surcharging. And it's already surcharging in the 18 inch pipe because that's under capacity. And then the 24 inch pipe taking a huge amount of, of impervious surface water, you know, sheet flow basically through the catch basins, you know, through this 24 inch line is coming into our system, <coughs> surcharging, it's backing up in every direction, and it's causing sheet flow. Um, over the top of the roadway. So what has happened is over time we have subsurface flow and we have surface flow that is undermining the roadway. So the eastbound lane of Route 9 is, is undermined that um, our, our manhole is actually collapsing and the entire lane is sort of slopping off the embankment. Um, if you were to stand on the other side of the, the guardrail there, you can sort of see the utility pole starting to lean, the whole embankment starting to erode, because we can't, we're not controlling what the water is doing. The water is going to just do what it's going to do, and the system is so over capacity um, that we've basically lost control of the situation. So that manhole is collapsing. We are losing the lane. Um, we've had it plated for a year. Um, we went through last winter and, you know, sort of survived. Um, we're really uh, to a place where, you know, we're, we're taking thousands of vehicles a day over the top of this, um, and we need to sort of uh, move on from this temporary situation. So, um, so now the question is, how do we fix this? Um, so we did a uh, significant amount of modeling about what the best way out of this situation would be. And what, what happens is because the, the field where all this water is ultimately landing is considered a wetland, we do have Conservation Commission concern. So there's a notice of intent that has to go to the Conservation, Conservation Commission where we announce you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we've modeled it and how we're actually going to improve the water flow and how we are actually mm -hmm. going to improve the already existing wetland in a portion of <coughs> your field. Um, so uh, what we started with was modeling a 10-year storm. So a 10-year storm would be five inches of rain over a 24-hour period. That would be considered a 10-year storm. So we looked at our manhole in the eastbound lane of, of, of Locust Street and we said, what do we need to do here in a 10-year storm to prevent a surcharge <coughs> of the system? And then we backed out of it from there. And what's, that's, a, what's a surcharge? What do you mean by that? Surcharge means water backs up. Oh. It, it means that the water cannot flow in the direction that it was originally intended to flow because there is too much of it too fast and the system is at capacity, so everything just backs up. So thank that's you. A, sorry, thank you. Um, so that's a surcharge. So what we did was we modeled this 10-year storm and then we backed into a solution. <laughs> The solution that we are proposing is that we take the 24-inch pipe that connects Smith's Vokes system to the city system, and we replace it with a 6-inch pipe. And we then divert the remainder of the water into a 30-inch outfall, which would flow into a basin, which would then flow into the field where the water is flowing anyway. It would just be a more controlled situation. The reason for the six inch pipe is because the city system can take the flow from a six inch pipe during a 10 year storm. 
it can actually take that flow all the time and the surplus water will go through the outfall. Now, we assume in our modeling, and we use 36 years of climate data from the nearest weather station in Holyoke right down the street. So over 36 years, we said, okay, you know, how many times do you get a 10-year storm? How many times do you get more than an inch of rain in an hour? Because you, you have to, you know, you sort of have to throw something against the wall when you're trying to design something like this. So we design for sort of a 10-year scenario, but we assume we are going to have scenarios where you have an inch of rain that happen in a 24-hour period. So that's where we sort of land it. That's, you know, how many times a year do you get an inch of rain in a 24-hour period? And over the past 36 years, using this climate data, um, and this was um, from 2006 back 36 years. And then we actually went from 2006 to present because the Holyoke station actually went out of service, so we had to go to an Amherst station. Um, and what we found is that you, you, in the course of 365 days, you get 10 to 11 events where you get an inch of water or more in a 24-hour period. So what our modeling found was that in all the rainstorms that you get, you typically get measurable rain 100 times a year. So in 10 to 11 of those scenarios, on average, taking the last you know, nearly 50 years of data, you would have a discharge to the outfall into the field. The rest of the time, all of the water would go to the city system. So what we're trying to do in, in those higher capacity events where we're getting more than an inch of rain in an hour, we are trying to divert this water out of the city system because the city system can't handle it. So we are trying to control where it's going and how it's going. So what we are proposing is, again, to replace the, the 24 inch pipe with a six inch pipe and then to create a 30 inch outfall. The outfall would be a pipe that daylights kind of halfway down that embankment, um, so just below the parking lot. What does lot. that mean, um, It would come out of the ground, so it would be buried in the ground, and then it would sort of come out of the ground, so it would just, the end of it would sort of appear mid-embankment. So if you picture an embankment like this, the, the pipe would sort of come right through the, the embankment to daylight. And below that, would construct a basin that would be five feet deep and that would take the heavy flow and then what we would do is we would create an area with uh, trap rock so big trap rock like 16 inch plus trap rock that's probably like 40 by 40 and what that would do is it would dissipate the water so let's just say we had you know a, a deluge uh, of water, we don't want to be sending that water uncontrolled into the field because then you're going to have a rain, you're going to have channeling, you're going to have undesirable effects. So what we want to do is we want to take that water and we want to control it to the extent possible and you do that by constructing a very robust basin with large rock and kind of a, a you know, capacity, you know, a five foot capacity where the water can, can sit. Um, and then what we did was we further modeled this and said, okay, we think this is going to happen on average 10 to 11 times a year based on almost 50 years of climate data. Um, how long is it going to take to dry the field out um, and where is the water going to go? So we modeled um, both of those things and it's interesting because when you look at like a satellite view of the field, you can actually see the wetlands defined within a satellite view. So the, the, the water is already flowing into the field. It's sort of hugging the embankment where the road is, and then it takes a left and ultimately flows into the brook. So the water is going to continue to follow that path. Um, and, and understanding that when it rains, you're going to have a discharge out of the outfall, so that discharge eventually ends because the rainstorm ends. So you know, it, what, how fast does it take to dry the field out? 
Um, our modeling shows between 24 and 48 hours, um, obviously depending on the intensity and the duration. Um, we would expect that water to be steered into the stream, which is where we're trying to get it to go. Um, and additionally, I, because right now we have a scenario where we just have uncontrolled water flow. I mean, our system's at capacity. Once our system backs up, the water just goes where it goes, and we can't control that. So it's going in all directions. It's flowing down Route 9, it's flowing into the field, you know, it's backing up. Um, in various places along Locust Street, and what it's also doing is deteriorating the outfall that we have a little bit further west down the road where the, uh, where the Elm Street Brook actually goes underneath Route 9. Um, so we have some sort of significant puddling, and, and puddling isn't even the right word. I mean, we, we just, we have, you know, problems with the head wall in this culvert. We have um, sort of deterioration of our facilities in this area because the system is just so surcharged. So what we're trying to do is we're just trying to control the heavy, heavy flows we have coming off of this campus into the city system that are significantly, <coughs> excuse me, you know, undermining the roadway. Um, and, it, you know, it, we will get to a point where um, we will lose that lane. We, we will get to a point where the manhole will completely collapse if we do nothing. Um, and we will get to a place where we will lose that lane. We will have to close it. Um, the embankment will start to shift. That utility pole will start to be undermined more than it is. Um, and we will be forced to kind of take more emergency actions. So, you know, my appeal tonight is we would really like to get this project done before the snow flies um, and, you know, build it right. I have a contractor standing by. I, I, I need your approval because we're working on your land. Um, and, and that's kind of the long, convoluted story, so I hope I didn't bore you too much. I'm ready to questions. I don't know if she was here at the beginning when you were talking about student safety, but if it becomes a three-lane road, does that mean we get our flashing lights for the <laughs> I'm sorry. I told her I'm going to raise her. Don't worry. This discussion is coming up between her and me. I'm buying her work. So. Anna is also the chair of Transportation and Parking Commission. So. <laughs> um, can I ask? Is that right to ask a couple? So uh, there's going to be a pipe sticking out of the embankment and. 10 to 11 times a year, water will flow out of it into a five foot concrete basin that will have trap rock in it or around it? Yeah, it's, it's a, it would be an earthen basin that we would create. Wait, so out of, the, so out we of would dig, soil? Yeah, we, oh, would, okay. we would dig, you know, we would dig a very large hole there um, gotcha. and, and create sort of five feet of you know, elasticity for, for the water. Um, and then, you know, we would uh, surround it with trap rock um, and, you know, install kind of swales to channel the water out of the trap rock and out of the basin. So we would be sending it in the exact path, right. it, although more controlled right. than how it's going now. It's just sort of going, you know, we would want to try to direct it. I mean, we can't dig in a wetland. The, there's basically a wetland that comes, you know, very close to the parking lot. I mean, is is actually already considered a wetland, so we can't do like construction from the wetland. So what we're trying to do is just keep the wetland the wetland, um, and and get the water to go where we want it to go. Um, and again, I just want to be clear about the 10 to 11 times. You know, these are averages. They're based yeah, yeah. on, you know, they're based on what we've found, you know, since 19. 70, does that sound right? So we went all the way back to 1970 um, to just sort of review, you know, climate data and how often could this yes. scenario happen. So I, um, knowing that this was on the agenda, I asked um, Tim Smith to take me over to, with, after checking with Dr. Lincoln Hogan first, to take me over to see, to understand it, and he had a lot of patience. Yeah, to keep explaining next time, maybe bring paper, but you know, so that I could understand the concept. And then um, some questions I had, he recommended that I call um, Sarah Lavalley, who mm -hmm. works in the Planning Commission, who is phenomenal. Like, how wonderful when you call a government employee and they are just top notch. Um, 
So I learned some things that were surprising to me. She said that property owners determine whether or not they're wetlands, that the conservation, like they don't determine if they're wetlands. That if you, once you submit a permit for something, if you want to change what you're doing, you know, like I'm mowing, if, it's, if I have a piece of property and it's a wetland and I'm mowing the grass, I can do that. But if I decide I want to put an addition on my house, then they say stop mowing and, you know, whatever. Um, so that's kind of a question in my mind. But, um, uh, so she said that they're, like, what, what you're describing, if it, if, if we do need permit, like, if they, there would have to be a hearing with the Planning Commission, is that what you're talking about? So that's, like, a 30-day timeline? So you are already planning on that? There is. So we need, we have an application packet that we have to submit to the Conservation Commission gotcha. so that they can review okay. what our plan is. But we do need the property owner's permission right, right. in order to even yep. get to that. That makes step. sense. But you're so you're already anticipating that. So yes. um, I know that some. So I, I mean, I think that if I'm understanding right, some of the concerns on on our end in terms of the mm -hmm. land is that um, the it, it, it's eroding. It, you know, potentially would erode some of the soil there, and also flooding the fields, making it, it unusable. <coughs> so um, or like that land less usable. Um, she also had so many great ideas about, if you were saying that we ha would have access to um, storm mitigation projects under capital improvements, um, like putting cisterns on A building and C building to catch the storm water on the roof or on the ground, that would so keep the land from, um, keep the water from, from going there. Um, which I don't know if this, you were saying that the city might pay for that, if I'm understanding. It needs to be a capital improvement program and, you know, we, there have been projects from Smith on them, so um, we're actually in the time when um, when projects get submitted to the city, and then so it's a five-year it's a five-year program that continues each year. So like every year we have the program and it gotcha. and then it sort of we have yep. um, yeah. Gotcha. So you know, like for example, we're talking about the windows. I think that were on the, were right. on the That's program last saying. year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I suggest we start putting projects on the program and you know, determine urgency and where they fit in the five-year plan. Right. She also suggested uh, a rain garden that could be potentially designed by students in horticulture, teachers and students in horticulture, to divert some of that water. Um, and she said that uh, the demand is really high for that out in the world. So if our students, you know, develop those skills, that that would benefit them. Um, she also. Uh, suggested that, you know, with Tim's concerns, and I don't know who else, you know, other people might have concerns as well, that um, that the, the DPW could, if we agreed to this, could construct it right away, um, address it right away, construct what's needed um, with the condition that we come back to it to see if if our land, land's being eroded or if it's not drying out, and then um, a commitment to mitigate that if that happens. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is when we build the animal control facility. When you build, when the animal control facility is built, that we consider um, pervious pavement, which she said is used in lately at the state um, park and ride, which is asphalt but with material in it that makes more rainwater go through. So something in the future. Yeah, conductor. Right. Um, one question, Donna. Just tell me how this works. The numbers that you're using with the pipe that's coming out of here is how many in diameter? What's the diameter coming right. out of Smith School? Right now it's 24 inch. Right. And what's the city's? The <coughs> 18. 18. And we're going to 6? Right, so you'd be going to 6 inch and 2 and 18. Numbers don't seem to be working here. Well, there's where the 30 inch outfall comes right. into play. Yeah, okay. That's going to spill into this basin. Right. My concern is is that percolating into the ground, aren't you creating this basin in a wetland type area? Or it's not the basin would not be in a wetland. The basin is actually above the wetland. Okay. And then discharges into a wetland. Okay, and then there's probably an overflow at the top of the dike per se that will spill out down into the field? So it's not designed with a spillway. It's a spillway, it's, okay. Yeah, it's not designed with a spillway. It's it's basically just a 30-inch outfall into a basin with trap rock 
with then a swale uh, beyond the trap rock, trap rock to steer the water into we'll, the existing wetland. We'll go down along the embankment along Route 9 at the edge of the field, right? Correct. And then into the brook? Correct. It, 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 would go, it would go left. It, it, it would actually take a left before the brook and, and follow the same path. Well, that's where I was confused. All right, it's not, it's not going along the embankment. Is there an underground culvert under 9 that goes towards state DPW? There is. There and they is. cleaned up that property to <laughs> last couple years because I ride the bike path <coughs> but behind there was a, almost a brownfield in my opinion yeah. but that's it's been all field. cleaned up yeah. so that water is not going to get introduced that way it gets introduced to the brook that goes down to the high school essentially and under the high school property and eventually to the basin out on Federal Street well we also have we also have a, a drain line on the westbound side of Locust Street, sort of unaffiliated with what we're talking mm -hmm. about. So we also have, again, very undersized, it's an eight inch uh, on the other but side of the street. that has nothing to do with our discussion. It, yes, but that is actually traveling underneath Route 9 and going into the brook down where mm -hmm. we're just talking about. So there's, there's a lot of things that are kind of converging at, at that area across from the state yard and, and going you know under route nine or over yeah, route nine yeah. and, and into the brook but i want to be clear about how the water is going to travel through the field it's going to travel along that embankment turn left prior to the stream or brook or whatever you want to call it and then it it sort of travels for i think a couple hundred feet kind of parallel with the brook and then eventually um kind of takes a right and goes into the brook. So it's not like a, a dead straight line. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it does take a left, but that's what it's doing right now. That's right. What it's already just, doing. Now. Just for clarifying, the embankment that you're referring to is not the embankment for Route 9 down to the field. It's the embankment where we took down some pine trees over the last few years here on the school property, correct? Is that the embankment? No, no, it's the embankment that travels parallel with Route 9. Okay. So that's where we're, st that's where the water's going now, right. and that's where the water would continue to go. It would follow that embankment all the I way down. I have a question. Tim, as far as the pastures in our animals, yeah. Yeah. is there any impact at all, the way this is going to work, to the flooding of the field to impact our pasture? So. That field is always wet. There's almost always standing water. So when you add that new surge of water, it's going to follow the path, but it's going to follow it fairly fast because it's already water in it. It's right. not going to so sink you're into the ground. With and when it does turn it's left, followed. it's going to go into that brook, and, and is it going to start eroding that brook, um, the bank, and then we start losing our pasture. I mean, up your sore line that cuts across that stream is already pushing the water into our pasture. So we keep moving our fence line back. So what happens when that happens? What hap what's, the, what's the solve on that? I think that, it, I mean, what we have right now is a, sorry, I'm not sure which direction to look, but um, what we have is, you know, we have uncontrolled water right now. Yep. And, and so I think it, it's very difficult with projects like this because you have a scenario where, you know, you get a three, four, five inch rainstorm and the water just goes where it goes. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's absolutely, Erosion, they're surcharging of the system, you know, it's kind of all over the place. I mean, what we're trying to do is control water, um, and we're trying to dissipate the energy of, you know, water coming off an eight acre impervious surface. And that's why we're building a very robust, you know, basin and with trap rock and this outfall, you know, because we're trying to sort of kill that energy. Yeah, and, I mean, and it sounds it. robust, but it's still going to get channeled down this one narrow spot. Abs absolutely. And it's going to take it a left and it's still going to dump into the brook and it's going to roll that. You walk down to that brook and look at that, how sharp that bank is. It, so all it, I want to know yes. is what, what happens when that starts moving? Can we throw trap rock in there and stop it? I, I mean, that's a whole nother... It's big. I talk to Sarah all the time yeah, yeah, about yeah. stopping that. Whole or digging out streams that are taking over the pastures. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... Because that would realistically, every storm, that could take a, a foot or two. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, you know, bank stabilization, yeah. and, and that's a whole nother conservation commission well, and open well, I think, waterway. Right? I think uh, 
that when Julie brought up yeah, we talking exactly. with Sarah that we'd want to revisit this. We're going to have to revisit it. And revisit it. it and see how it's eroding and affecting our, our fields. Um, and we're obviously going to catch 22. The city needs to mitigate this, do something. Right. And it's already currently eroding the field. <laughs> Just in an uncontrolled way. Yes, and, and yet we're going to add more flow to, to this thing, and Tim's point is very valid. We're going to create more erosion down there, but it, let's be realist here. We've got a problem, we've got to solve it, and we need to hopefully, well, we would certainly want some guarantee of some sort that this is revisited to protect our interests. She said the state does it all the time and that you would be familiar with that protocol of saying we're going to go ahead and address this immediate need and then revisit right. it. Right. Can, can you give us a letter uh, that we can put in our files that we can go back in with your blessing to look at it if there's a problem? Yeah, I, I mean, often, you know, our projects are in, are approved with strings, you know, yep. and, and the strings are we are going to document existing conditions. Here's what the existing condition is. You know, if we come back in 24 months and the existing condition is no yeah, longer. But, but I, like I, this. I, just for the comfort of our school, and that's our job to protect the school, is to have something on file that, I mean, maybe Julie's going to be the chairperson, and, or, or and, and it's, you know, 10 years from now, and somebody says, well, we don't have it. Well, I want something is what I'm saying, is that, that we can fall back on if there's an issue. Yeah. I can think, you help me with that? I think the, the venue for that would be the Conservation Commission. So what I would do is, um, talk, when, when this comes up at the Conservation Commission, you know, I would be happy to request um, that that you know the project is approved, but we obviously need to should monitor. One, should one of us be there at that meeting? I I think that would be fine as yeah, a, you know a representative right. of the school. But I I mean having been here, I'm more than happy to commit to uh, a conversation with Sarah um, and and then kind of have um, approval issue you know with the caveat that. Um, well, if it's, been, if it's been broken this long, Donna, and I'm not contesting that, and I know it has to be fixed around there, there's no question in my mind, and I think we're all in agreement, we've got to do something. But I'd like to table this till next month until I can get a clear answer from the Conservation Commission or whoever's going to give it to me that we're protected, that the school is protected. If something goes Dixie, 24 months, as you said, I want to have something in writing that I can go back to the city on and say, wait a minute, I got this here that said they're going to fix it. You have a video of this meeting. I do. You do. <laughs> and I also am hearing her say that if we, if, or if she on our behalf, or we can go to the Conservation Commission and at that, in that place, say, because they have to ask for permission, approval from the Conservation Commission, so we say, right. they're going to send a packet to them. Right, but I can't. So, so, so sequentially, I thought you said there'll be a hearing. Won't there be a hearing? Yes. Yeah, so sequentially, yeah. the Conservation Commission cannot contemplate this until they have a signature and right. a packet. They can't comment on this or or even tell you what they may or may not do. So they need the application. Yeah, they need oh, the application. Sure. And then we come, or she says, look. You've got to attach this to the approval. So I think what Julie's getting at, uh, Mr. Kaling, is we do have some recourse still to that point. And, and, and being a realist, um, not wanting to give up the farm or the field, right. um, she's on a timeline to get things done. Right, and and we got to keep the, ball, the, the, the process moving forward. Uh, so we're going on record with, like Mayor Sierra, just we have a video of, 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 of yep. this in the minutes. Okay. So I think we're we're protected. Okay. Okay. Um, so with reservation, I would I would be okay signing the notice of intent, and with these caveats in place, and we're going to hold people accountable. Very good. So at this point, may I? 
have a motion and a second. We've had our discussion in for a vote on signing the Department of Public Works NOI submission to the Conservation Commission, which enumerates needed alterations in the addition of an outfall of the campus storm water system. So moved. Second. Any All further in discussion? I, I want to ask Tim, um, can you weigh in on a time frame that you think that you would be comfortable with for us to revisit this to see what it We can just put some stakes on the bank and, and see what happens, right? But I mean, we, we, you'd want to yeah. watch it. We can watch it over, over the year. So would you want 12 months we revisit this yeah. to see? Okay, thank you. 12 months? Yeah, I'd send survey down there just so we know where everything is. Thank you. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. I Thank you, Don. Yeah, thanks. I, I do have the documents in hand, but I can send it by email if that works or if it's, I don't so want to. You need it signed. I do need a signature, but I can. Can I take it and I'll get it to you tomorrow? That'd be great. Okay. Came prepared. <laughs> she always does. <laughs> And this is so the chair. And we only need to sign one from there is two just in case. Two just in case. Okay, thank you all. I appreciate thank you, your time. Me. Take care. So this next one, they have a motion and a second to approve the federal and state grant manual. Somebody else has got to move through. Can you so move? I'm uh, I'm just going with the flow here because I'm not fully understanding this line <laughs> item. So um, can I get a brief explanation, please? Sure. It's in your uh, packet right here. Okay. Is, is that all, do you want to? All, you, you okay. I, so I'm all right. The, um, so this. I'm the chair of the um, policy subcommittee. Yeah. And so Crystal asked me to look at this. It is basically like fill in the template that the state gives you with the name of the school and other relevant Okay, so you, you've reviewed it. You're yeah. comfortable. It's so complex. Good enough for it's me. unbelievable what we have to go through. To, for, yeah, to no, I see that. And, and, yeah, good. And, but yeah, yep, so I did. I read the whole thing. So, so we have a motion and a second. So motion. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. May have a motion and a second to approve the creation of the Collaborative for Educational Services Capital Reserve Account with a balance limit of $5 million for the purpose of accumulating funds for the acquisition, maintenance, and improvement of capital items. Julie, you want to speak to that? To remove and second first? Yeah, we can. So, okay. Discussion? Second. Okay, discussion. Okay. So, um, you remember at the last meeting, I told you that the collaborative uh, was using its um, the forgiveness of its PPP loan to purchase their buildings, right? right. Um, so they want to be able to maintain the buildings, but they can't set up a capital reserves account without the approval of two thirds of the member districts. And our collaborative has far more member dis member districts than any other collaborative. It's hard to even get a forum to get a meeting there because of it. Um, so I just, that, so they, they received their PPP loan to cover a gap in revenues from programming, keep people employed during the pandemic. They were ultimately able to pivot as an organization. They increased their revenue again. They set aside the funds to repay the loan when it was forgiven, <coughs> funds to pay off the mortgages, place the excess revenue into a fund balance account as a safety net and fund this capital reserve account okay. to renovate and maintain the building. So how does this specifically affect us? So we... We're just signing up as a, a member. Yeah, we're a collaborative member district, and state law says the collaboratives exist to serve the districts, and they can't do anything without district approval. So one thing districts would be worried about is are we going to have to fund this capital reserve account? Like if they start going up. Yeah. yeah, but they... So they want to make it very clear that they already have money for this account, from the excess of the, you know, the revenue that they made and what they set aside to repay a loan and then it was forgiven. 
So we're not going to be on the hook for anything. Our role. Then you're comfortable with that. 100. percent Yeah, and our role is to authorize the creation okay. of the account. They would have to come to uh, us for any request for any kind of money for anyway. All yeah. right. So any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. There's a paper to sign there too, but. Okay, I'll let you handle that. I don't have to do All right, I will. Okay. So, future business, November 15th. No, you got one more. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh sorry. They have a motion to set to approve the following surplus for reseal for agricultural <coughs> mechanics one drill press. So, second. That was the second case. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. No, I can. Mm -hmm. November 15th, we the Board of Trustees meeting at 5 o'clock to whenever in the library. December 20th, regular Board of Trustees meeting 5 in the library. January 17th, regular Board meeting 5 whenever. We talked about the upcoming events. November 6th, our open house from 11 to 2, campus wide. And we have a motion and a second to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? 